to be able to introduce our SOTA lecture. That's the state of the art plenary lecture uh, by Louis uh, Garza, MD, PhD from Johns Hopkins. The title of his presentation will be Walking with Billingham's Ghost. And I'm sure you're all interested to learn about how that uh, plays into his research. Uh, Dr. Garza is an associate professor of dermatology with secondary appointments in cell biology and oncology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He did his undergraduate work at Cornell University, followed by an MD PhD at University of Pennsylvania. He completed his dermatology residency at the University of Michigan, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship in the lab of George Costarellis at UPenn. Dr. Garza's current research focuses on wound healing and regenerative medicine. His lab is funded by the NIH through NIAMS and the DOD and a Maryland State Stem Cell Fund. Uh, Dr. Garza is a member of our board in the SID. And with that, uh, it's my personal pleasure to introduce Louis Garza. Take it away, Louis. Thanks. Um, thanks for that uh, intro. Um, so yeah, um, I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, thanks for everybody for sticking on and listening. Um, also, congratulations to the organizers. Um, you know, of pulling out this fantastic meeting under these circumstances. So over about the next like 20 odd minutes, I'll show you how I've been chasing uh, Billingham's ghost. So who, who was Billingham? A lot of you guys are probably wondering. Uh, well, um, I didn't know much about him before uh, I started kind of understanding that I'm following his, his path. Um, he was born in 1921 in the UK, uh, passed away here in the United States, um, was educated at Oxford, and also uh, his PhD advisor won the Nobel Prize uh, for a lot of important work that led to our understanding of um, uh, transplant immunology. Um, and I'll be coming back to him to tell you like how, 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 why his ghost has been haunting me. Um, so the focus of my lab, um, like a lot of us that are interested in regenerative medicine, is um, this question of whether we can reinitiate morphogenesis in an adult. Um, and you know, the most beautiful example, the talisman for us all is the salamander, where you can um, remove the salamander's arm and it can grow back in a period of 40 days, uh, recapitulating all the structures that were there for a fully functional unit. Um, we think this holds a lot of promise for medicine because if you look at a lot of the morbidity of, uh, of, of our patients, it's from scarring. So for example, we're pretty good at replacing the blood flow after a heart attack or after a stroke, but it's really the scar afterwards that's a problem. So if we, and we know that these um, genetic programs for organogenesis are present in every single cell of our body. So the question is, can we reactivate them as an adult? I'm trying to teach myself acrylic painting. And so uh, this was a really neat experiment that I just thought I'd share with the audience where um, they tried to understand if they could trick a salamander to making a supernumerary arm or an extra arm. And um, they're able to do it by just doing some simple skin surgery. So they do a rotation flap, so they uh, excise some skin and then uh, rotate it so that the positional identity is mismatched to the cells around it. And they reroute a nerve, and that's enough to trick a salamander into making a new, a new arm. Okay, so the question is, well, if we can't regrow a whole limb now, um, there's kind of two questions that I'm going to ask during today's talk. The first one is, can we at least regrow a hair follicle mini appendage? And I'll show you a lot of the work that's been done and, and by fantastic people in our field on that and, and, and a little bit from our lab. Um, and then the second part of the talk, um, I'll present some unpublished data where we said, well, can, you, uh, can we at least regrow that thick type of skin we have on our palms and soles at the stump site of an amputee? So uh, for the first part, um, I'm gonna be talking about nuclear hormones. Um, it's easy to forget how powerful these are. Um, and speaking about limb uh, regeneration or, or limb development, um, this, this nuclear hormone receptor uh, antagonist, the thyroid hormone, um, is what controls the conversion from an amphibian that's a uh, uh, tadpole to a land-based um, amphibian with, with um, legs. So uh, clearly um, these nuclear hormones are really powerful. And the one I'll talk to you about today is, is retinoic acid. Um, and that'll be this, this first part of the talk where I'll talk about hair follicle neogenesis. Um, and I'll introduce that in a second. So, um, you know, uh, what's the reason why it might be interesting to look at a hair follicle neogenesis is there's a lot of really interesting overlap in the developmental biology uh, between hair follicle development and limb development. And that's why we call hair follicles a mini appendage. So if you look at like mutations in beta catenin or P63, for very severe loss of function uh, mutations, um, those mice don't develop limbs. If you have less severe mutations so those mice can survive, you also can notice they have less hair follicle. Um, so if we can understand how to um, develop a new hair follicle, we might be able to eventually understand how to make a new limb. 
Um, and right now, uh, you know, when I was in training, rather, I was taught just um, like we are taught now for limbs that it's impossible to grow a new hair follicle um, because uh, it's really a complicated structure. So, um, you know, there's at least three different types of stem cells that are located in the hair follicle. There's more than 10 epithelial lineages. Um, it's invested with blood vessels and nerves. Um, it's a, it's a, a very, it's possibly the most complicated structure in the skin. It cycles. Um, and so uh, that's why it was, really, it was really dogmatic, you know, just as soon as uh, 20 years ago, um, that you couldn't make a, a new hair follicle if you'd lost it. Um, but it turns out people had forgotten that. And one of the people they'd forgotten was Billingham. So it turns out this is a nature paper from 1956, uh, where Billingham uh, uh, wrote with his co-author Russell, um, that from the smooth bald surfaces of, of an incompletely contracted wound, fine hairs begin to emerge. Uh, which is pretty neat that Billingham noticed that. He wasn't actually the first person. Uh, it looked like it might, and as far as we know, it could, could have been Charles Breedis um, who first noticed it in rabbits. And um, what Breedis noticed is if you do very large uh, wounds on the back of a rabbit, there's this uh, recapitulation of embryogenesis just um, in the center of the wound with this periphery of scar. Um, and that was um, the, the focus of, of the original work is kind of defining um, that phenomena. And it was largely forgotten uh, until um, uh, recently when uh, this from a very elegant piece of work from uh, Mayumi Ito and George Pozzarellis, they basically rediscovered um, that this indeed does happen. It happens in mice and they even define the genetic pathway that it uh, involves, namely that uh, beta catenin and the Wnt pathways evolve. Um, so these are some pictures from Mayumi's uh, beautiful paper, landmark paper where um, after an uh, initial wound, uh, first you just see a scar, but eventually you start seeing these white hair follicles that Billingham uh, and Breedis noticed, for example. Um, uh, and that if you look at it histologically, um, you see a, a recapitulation of all the steps of organogenesis. Um, and interestingly, a lot of these epithelial invaginations are how a lot of our organs form. Um, and it starts as um, this hair germ um, that uh, progresses to a hair peg, um, and through all the kind of uh, steps of um, hair follicle formation until you have a fully functional hair follicle uh, with all those lineages, a sebaceous gland, um, and, and, it, and it really must be invested with blood vessels, uh, for example, to exist. If we look at it um, by, uh, by whole mount, um, this is a, a, a stain for K17, which is a keratin for hair follicles. Um, we can see that uh, just like in the rabbit, um, at first you only see these hair follicles on the periphery, uh, but with time, you can see these new hair follicles forming in the very center um, and that become eventually mature. Um, and so there's been a lot of really fantastic, beautiful work done on this um, since that, this landmark paper by Mayumi Ito's lab and George Katsuros' lab, as well as uh, Max Plikas and, and many others. Um, and um, the question we wanted to contribute to this, to the field is try to ask, what were some of the earliest events that trigger this? So we know that developmental events are important, for example. So um, those groups had shown that like Wince and Sonic Hedgehog are clearly important. And we were curious about what are the earliest events that are known to be associated with wound healing that might reactivate these uh, developmental pathways. And so to address that, um, we did a screen of um, high versus low regenerating mice. So the, the mouse on the right is a mixed strain of mouse. Um, that's uh, out, more outbred and has good regeneration. Um, and then the one on the left is your C57 black kind of standard strain that has really poor dif differentiation. And so we wanted to ask what, what was the difference between these mice right at the beginning of wound closure, um, but, uh, but certainly before uh, morphogenesis had happened. So the wound typically closes about 12 days after these extremely large wounds. The earliest time you can detect any hair follicle formation is about four days later. So we wanted to ask at this very early time, right after the keratinocytes kind of meet at the junction uh, and before any morphogenesis had occurred, what's the difference between these higher regenerating mice and lower regenerating mice? Um, and so uh, we did microarrays for this and um, our hit, which I'll show you for in a second, was this, a very strong signature for toll receptor three and double strand RNA. So it was um, most classically known that double strand RNA is to help ward off viruses and not just RNA viruses, but DNA viruses as well. It's probably really involved, it's probably very important for the for COVID defense, uh, for example. Um, and um, it's these, uh, these viral RNAs are known to bind toll receptor 3, for example, and initiate an immune cascade um, that help uh, fight off uh, virus. Um, but it's also known that it's a damage associated molecular pattern. Um, and so 
in that regard, we thought this could be interesting. And there had been fantastic work before we started from Rich Gallo's lab, for example, that really highlighted the, the power of double strand RNA. Um, so we were curious, could this be related to um, this regeneration phenomenon? So um, this is a, a, a microarray analysis that I want to share with you guys that kind of uh, proved to us that it was likely double strand RNA is important for this response. So on the right um, are arrays that I just described to you. These are in vivo arrays where we're comparing higher regenerating mice versus lower regenerating mice. We're not adding any double strand RNA, of course, which is poly IC. Um, that's the synthetic version of it. And we just said, what are the top 200 genes uh, in, in, in that experiment? On the right, on the left here are a completely different uh, experimental setup. This is in vitro. It's not in vivo. These were human keratinocytes. They're not mouse. And here, uh, investigators uh, applied poly IC, this double strand RNA. And, we, and this was a published array right when we were starting this work. And we asked, what were the top 200 genes from um, that array? Um, and when we looked for the oversec, the intersection of these, it was really impressive. 25 of these genes were identical with a very uh, high p-value. Um, and I want to call your attention to um, these OAS family, which we're going to come back to. Um, these are known to be also double-strand RNA sensors. This is uh, the OAS 1, 2, 3, uh, and L are every single um, member of the family, and they were all present in this list. So we were very curious about OAS biology, and we'll come to, back, come to that in a second. But our first question was, if we know that double-strand RNA is known to be a damage-associated molecular pattern, could that mean that uh, damage actually enhances regeneration? So for this experiment, we, we joke we did um, surgery as if a med student might, which is very halting and a little bit more extra damage on the periphery of the wound uh, versus a straight kind of pure, uh, straight edge cut. So the same wound size, but just more damage in, in this case on the right and on the left. And we noticed that there, was, there indeed was more regeneration with more damage, which kind of was again suggested that this damage associated molecular pattern might be important. Um, so the next thing is said, well, can we just add exogenous uh, double strand RNA and modify this response? So this experiment, we added um, double strand RNA or an enzyme that um, degrades double strand RNA that I will talk about. So we added just a single dose of 500 nanograms of double strand RNA just two days after wounding. And then about a month later, uh, uh, three weeks later, we looked to see uh, if that modified regeneration. And the uh, cool news is that indeed we saw that was the case that after adding uh, the single dose of double strand RNA, uh, we could see very uh, significant uh, increases of um, WIN, of, of wound induced herniogenesis in our model. Um, when we look at the toll free knockout, uh, we can, the loss of function, we can see um, that there's a loss of regeneration also. It's consistent with the importance of this pathway. So basically up to now what I've showed you is that double strand RNA and toll receptor three are both necessary and sufficient for WIN and the damage increases, increases regeneration. And so this had some, an important implication to us uh, that many of you might be thinking. Uh, right now we know that dermatologists uh, before COVID certainly uh, were, were really having a lot of fun torturing their patients. Um, they would do laser, dermabrasion, peels, microneedling, everything short of putting them into a dungeon um, uh, to try to enhance uh, um, rejuvenation, facial rejuvenation after photoaging. So there are a lot of damage associated techniques people are using that don't have a lot of obvious commonalities um, that are used to kind of get rid of fine wrinkles after photoaging. And so we were curious, could it actually be that a lot of these are actually also working through double strand RNA? So uh, the first question we had asked was pretty simple. What are the gene expression changes that are happening after standard laser rejuvenation treatments that occur? So here we did a, a really fun collaboration with uh, some of our cos uh, cosmetic dermatologists in our department, Mary Shu, and a medical dermatologist, Nori, who actually was on that original um, Nature paper, um, and uh, where we try to look at um, people who are getting uh, fractional laser, fra fraxel lasers, to see um, if there was an improvement um, in their uh, photoaging and what genes that was associated with. Um, so this is the treatment area that was occurring um, after the laser. Uh, this shows you some of the fine wrinkle improvement from baseline that happened. Um, and all of these were um, quantified uh, with the Griffith score. I saw there was a question from Dr. Griffiths earlier, so it's great to know he's in the audience. And um, there's, a, there's, we saw statistically uh, um, significant increases of, of photoaging scores in our patients. So the next question was, well, I mean, that's all pretty standard. What were the gene expression changes that were happening in these folks? So what I'll show you next is a volcano plot, um, and it was pretty impressive. So this is, this is the full change on the x-axis. Each this is a full change on the x-axis and a p-value on the y-axis. Each dot is a gene. Um, and then um, the red ones are the ones that were up in our um, uh, regeneration arrays in, in the human and the mouse. 
And you can see that, again, every single member of the OAS family, OAS 1, 2, 3, and L, were among the most highest full chains with the highest p-value. So we thought this is probably pretty consistent that double strand RNA um, might be um, part of why laser rejuvenation is working. Um, but we thought, uh, let, let's kind of feed this into a uh, computer algorithm. You know, one of our first great talks at this plenary session was on um, machine learning. So we said, you know, without any bias, let's plug this into an ingenuity program that says, all right, we know these are all the, all the genes that are changing. Ingenuity can help predict what are the upstream things that would typically turn on all these genes. So if there was an ingenuity category for laser, that should be number one. There wasn't that, um, but this is the exact list. I haven't edited it all from ingenuity. Uh, and the cool thing is you can see number four is poly-IC, it's double strand RNA. So it's clear that that's um, a very high signature. But there was something else that I want to call your attention to that's going to be the focus of this part of the talk, which was tretinoin. Um, so uh, tretinoin is um, uh, retin-A or retinoic acid. Retinoic acid. Um, and um, it's, it was known that retinoic acid is really important for photoaging. Um, so this is some work uh, done from the University of Michigan by Siwon Kong and, and his colleagues there. Um, where uh, they were some of the first uh, folks along with people at Penn to kind of pioneer the use of retinoic acid for photoaging. And you can see there's really dramatic benefit from it. Um, and it still continues to be a product that's commonly sold. Um, oh, sorry, my computer's freezing up here. Okay. All right. I might have to stop sharing myself. Um, all right. Okay. Oh no, it worked. Okay, fantastic. Oh, we're back in business. Okay, so um, the question could be uh, was then um, could double strand RNA work through retinoids? So this is Renova, the, the common thing that's commonly used. So we we're curious, what is the relationship uh, with double strand RNA uh, and retinoic acid, um, and and is there a cellular overlap to these um, to these agents? Um, so here, uh, what we did is we took primary keratinocytes um, isolated from foreskins and we treated them in vitro either with retinoic acid or double strand RNA. Uh, and then we measured their transcriptome and also their proteome to say how much was their, uh, what was the overlap like? Um, so first, first off, looking at the transcriptome, you can see it, the genes that are up here or the genes that are down. And again, there was a really dramatic overlap. So out of 40,000 transcripts, um, and you look at the top 100, uh, you know, 13% of them were identical um, of the ones that went up and 18% of them were identical the ones that were going down. Um, and it was really exciting for us because there were common um, genes that were um, looked to be important, for example, keratin-19 is a well-known bulge marker for uh, keratinocyte stem cells, and that was the one that was commonly um, up, uh, an upregulated transcript in this 100. One's for differentiation, so the, they, they would act differently from a stem cell that would cause, you know, superbasal differentiation like keratin-1, or be associated with superbasal differentiation like keratin-1, uh, was one of the examples of one that was commonly down. So again, it looks like stimulating a more basal uh, and stem cell kind of phenotype rather than a differentiated keratinocyte phenotype. Uh, and we looked at uh, the proteome, uh, be probably because the universe is a little bit smaller for the proteome, um, the increase was even more dramatic. So um, and the overlap was even more dramatic. So looking at um, genes that were commonly up, um, it's 61 of the, gene of, the, of the proteins out of the top 100 were identical. So that just shows you that the cellular response to retinoic acid and double strand RNA in vitro at least is extremely overlapping. Um, so, and you know, the common categories here were epithelial cell development and the ones that were going down are, are going to be um, um, differentiation. All right. Um, so for the next part, uh, we, we started working with Dr. Maureen Kane here in Baltimore. She works at the University of Maryland. We're lucky that uh, one of the experts for uh, mass spectrometry measurements for retinoic acid happened to be uh, working in Baltimore. She works in a yellow room because you have to, uh, retinoic acid, like a lot of people know, is light sensitive. Um, so we worked with Maureen to say, well, is it the case that double strand RNA might actually turn on retinoic acid? So could it be that these are all in the same pathway? And the fact that, you know, dermatologists are using laser and, and Renova and tretinoin for photo aging might be because they're actually all in the same biological pathway. So for this experiment, what we did is we just took, again, those foreskin keratinocytes and um, added double strand RNA and then did mass spec on them. Um, and the great thing is we saw really dramatic inductions of retinoic acid, so there was clear um, synthesis of it. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details for the sake of time, um, but it was, it was uh, LDH183 that's doing it. Um, interestingly enough, when we look at a toll 3 knockout mouse, those act just at baseline even without any wounding. Uh, by mass spectrometry, they have less retinoic acid, which uh, raises a lot of really fun, interesting questions. 
that I look forward to discussing with you guys uh, now and now and later. Um, and uh, just to kind of cut through a lot of other work, um, the next thing we said was, uh, well, let's look at um, receptors. We looked at both RAR, RAR gamma and RAR alpha, the retinoic acid receptor alpha, it turns out was the real player for us. So uh, we knew that one of these receptors was likely important for, for WIN. Uh, and um, when we treat retinoic acid, when we uh, treat mm, with double strand RNA to our retinoic acid receptor alpha knockout mice, we see no response. So um, just at a baseline, without any treatment, uh, the RAR alpha knockout mice have much less WIN. After double strand RNA, we, see, we can see this increase in wild type but we see still no increase at all at uh, RAR alpha knockout mice. So they're completely unresponsive um, to double strand RNA and kind of is good, good evidence that they're likely involved in this pathway. Um, so for the conclusion of this first part, uh, it's that double strand RNA induces appendage regeneration um, and it also induces retinoic acid synthesis and signaling and it's part of this conserved pathway. So double strand RNA um, activates retinoic acid to promote regeneration and rejuvenation in mouse and man respectively. Um, and it, there's probably a lot of really interesting work to be done here to kind of define, uh, for example, what is the double strand RNA? And, we're, and I'm sure that's a question in a lot of your minds and it's something we're actively working on right now. So for this uh, next part, I'll, I'll show you something else um, uh, relating to this uh, limb regeneration question. And, and this is um, to try to get at this problem. If you ask it just uh, uh, an upper limb amputee, uh, even just at normal use, how often they use their prosthetic, um, and it's just 24 days per month without any problems. So if somebody told you, oh, you can only use your arm for you know, 24 days out of the month, you'd be pretty upset. Um, and so this is a, a, a real problem we, try to, we want to try to address and try to help. Um, but it, even in, uh, that, that this isn't the best use, but there's a lot of problems even that routinely do happen with skin breakdown and infections um, at the stump side of amputees. And so the, the solution we were wondering about was perhaps we could create, recreate or reprogram the skin at the stump site to be this uh, palmo plantar skin that we have on our palms and soles that's naturally uh, pressure, pressure resistant uh, and friction resistant. And so the goals for this uh, study was to ask, you know, can we convert um, non-volar skin to volar skin? Um, and um, we know that there's, for example, like a thin epidermis in non-volar skin and the epidermis gets thicker uh, in volar skin. And uh, while there are some keratins that are retained, we know there's some unique keratins like keratin 9 that are different. Um, and so this was the question we wanted to ask. Um, and when I asked this question, I didn't know Billingham had worked on this, but it turns out Billingham had. So um, this is why Billingham's chasing my, uh, is chasing me. I, this is, I know these are pretty, two pretty different projects uh, and, and I thought they were kind of unique and different, but uh, it turns out in a 1963 uh, NEJM article, um, Billingham was already asking about what is the origin and conservation of these different uh, epidermal specificities we have. And several years later, he did a really important study that helped kind of uh, found how we would approach this pro problem, where he took um, and he swapped different types of epidermis and dermises. So here, uh, he's taking dermis from the sole, and he, he either scraped it or didn't scrape it. He scraped it because he thought maybe there was um, some um, involved some contamination of keratinocytes, for example. So that's how we went through scraping. Um, and then uh, to that dermis, he added different types of epidermis. He either added no epidermis, or we would add a sole epidermis, or ear epidermis, or trunk epidermis. Um, and then he asked, what was the final phenotype? And it, of course, uh, if he added no epidermis, uh, he had some problems and it was just granulation tissue. If he added sole epidermis, naturally you would get a uh, sole uh, epidermis would kind of uh, survive there and continue because it had sole dermis. But interestingly, if he took ear or trunk uh, epidermis, because they were on sole dermis, they would be reprogrammed to a sole uh, epidermal phenotype. So this was evidence that the dermis was partially at least in control of epidermal phenotype. Um, so the idea then uh, that we would uh, propose based on that work and really also fantastic work that like other investigators had done since then like Yamaguchi um, to really address even this particular um, potential use of it is the question is can we inject volar fibroblasts into the dermis here into the stump site for example and have those um, fibroblasts re partially at least uh, reprogram the epidermis um, so that we can have uh, 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 better outcomes for amputees. So the first question we asked was, well, what's the, what's the best marker for volar skin? So here's just some microarrays um, that confirm something that a lot of people already knew, 
which is this lone red dot of our normal palm and soul in humans is keratinine. So keratinine is, is the most uh, upregulated gene um, in palmal plantar skin uh, compared to non-palmal plantar skin. So um, that, that's a, a, an important marker we're going to have to look at. And so uh, we've done a lot of work in vitro on this. We've done work in mice. But today, for the sake of time, I'm just going to show you some uh, unpublished results we have on a human trial. So what we're doing here uh, with Department of Defense support and NIH support um, is we're um, biopsying the sole and scalp of healthy subjects. We're growing up their fibroblasts uh, in, in a, um, in a you know, FDA-approved manner and IRB-approved manner, of course. Uh, and we're injecting into the leg either vehicle only, sole fibroblasts, or scalp fibroblasts. So these ectopic fibroblasts. We wait for five months, and then we remove the skin to see uh, what, how the tissue has changed. Um, and there, there's a lot of different uh, ways of approaching this. It's going to be great to hear people's advice about ways we can uh, uh, hone, hone this work. Um, this is what it looks like for the cell injection. It's just a cell slurry, like a cloudy solution that we're injecting. Um, we tattoo the site so we can be really careful and go exa back exactly to where we injected. Um, the worst side effects we've seen is some hyperpigmentation uh, in our, uh, some post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation probably um, in, in our uh, more darker pigmented subjects. Um, but other than that, it's been extremely safe. Um, and so the question is, uh, you know, how do volar fibroblasts change the local tissue? Um, so the first thing we did was use a fibrometer to say, um, if we just use a, a device to measure how firm the skin is, does the skin firmness change uh, um, with this uh, fibrometer? Um, and the great news is that it did. Um, so this is some pre preliminary data. That's uh, this, like what you see in the background here. Um, so we only have two time points at this last, uh, that's the last 20 week point, but we have you know, four for all the other ones. And I think the pattern's pretty clear here. Where with vehicle, um, there's some minor fluctuations, um, but the skin fibrometer chain, do, change, do, you know, it doesn't really happen with time. However, if we're injecting scalp or sole fibroblasts, we're seeing increases in both. Um, and again, it's hard to know the relative difference yet, but um, certainly we're seeing differences in skin firmness. So we're seeing some physical changes in the skin with the cell therapy that are persistent, you know, for many weeks. Um, next, we said, well, what about keratinine? So this was our best keratinine um, individual, responding individual, uh, where, you know, normally we know keratinine, like I showed you in that microarray, has very low expression um, uh, at our non-volar skin. But if we um, inject these volar fibroblasts, that's where we, we've, in some of our subjects, we've seen the best response, and it's in the right place. Normally, keratinine is super basilar, um, and that, that's where we're seeing it um, in these subjects. Um, so this is the quantitation of all the subjects we've done, about a little more than 30 so far. Um, and we're seeing statistically significant increases of keratinine protein uh, in our subjects. So there is, of course, a lot of biological variation. Um, the next is we've looked at some other histological markers of it. So um, this is looking at um, epidermal thickness. Uh, and we're seeing some um, changes of epidermal thickness that are significant also. So we're seeing inc like what, all these graphs are organized the same way where on the left there's native tissue. So this is native foot versus sole, where you can see this increase of um, normal epidermal thickness. Also, hand versus palm, we can see this uh, normal increase. Um, and now we're all looking at the leg here. So this is all non-volar. And we're either injecting vehicle, scalp, or sole fibroblasts. And we're seeing that there's this increase of epidermal thickness, especially when we're adding the sole fibroblasts. Um, the next thing we uh, noticed uh, was that in some of our subjects, that there looked like there was an increase in cytoplasmic size. This is the same picture I showed you earlier. Uh, but you can tell that the keratinocytes look larger um, and so we didn't actually know at, that, at this time that keratinocyte size was uh, uh, different in normal volar skin. And that, that might be kind of an underappreciated thing, probably. So the first thing we did is just verify that that was the case. So looking at native foot, uh, native you know, dorsum of the uh, foot versus the ventral sole, we can see that there is a significant increase of cytoplasmic size in our uh, sole and our palmar plantar skin, at least in the sole. Um, and when we're doing um, our cell therapy, uh, we can also see that there's increases in cytoplasmic size um, after the sole uh, fibroblast injection. So, the, so again, the epidermis is changing with this fibroblast therapy. Um, we started look, we're starting to look at some uh, dermal changes. So this is looking at uh, collagen fibril length um, using uh, second harmonic generation. And we can see that when we, uh, in native skin, of course, uh, at, at the palmar plantar sites, the collagen fibrils are longer, probably consistent with that more firm skin we have there. And we can see with this um, sole injections, we all, we're also seeing uh, increases of um, collagen length. Um, so the last thing I want to show you um, is uh, recent RNA-seq data. So we're kind of sorting through this. But again, this is uh, work done by an algorithm. So this is David. So 
here we did we took some uh, uh, six subjects where we had um, RNA um, after five months, um, and we're comparing a volar fibroblast injected areas versus vehicle. Um, and we're just asking, you know, the top 127 transcripts that were changed out of about 44,000. And we just had, uh, asked for what's the common gene ontology categories of these uh, in, in a David analysis. And the cool news is uh, we, we're seeing a morphogenesis signatures. So I like to joke that David doesn't know that I start all my talks with this question that I want to induce morphogenesis in, in adults. Uh, and this is a meager example, um, but the good news is I, it's, we're starting to see some success. So uh, we're going to continue to anal analyze what some of these genes and, and pathways are. Um, so um, the final slide is we're starting to, because of these promising results, we're starting to test in, um, amputees. And uh, our first amputee he had some small decreases in an ulcer he had located, uh, but we're going to continue to follow these guys and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully we can give them some, some benefit. Uh, so the final conclusions are that, um, you know, we're seeing some promising changes. And also the great thing is fibroblast therapy might have many other applications. So, you know, the prevention of fresh ulcers or maybe even a cell therapy platform for protein delivery that we're excited to pursue in the future as well. So um, a lot, the big conclusion here is the promise of regenerative medicine. These are a lot of the people that helped out. Uh, Dong Wan uh, pioneered a lot of the retinoic acid story with helps with Rosie. Um, Amanda Nelson uh, pioneered the double strand RNA story. She has her own lab at Penn State. She has a lot of exciting work. I, I please encourage uh, you guys to follow her work here at the SID. Uh, also, Sashank Reddy um, helped out with the double star RNA story. He also has his own lab now at Hopkins. Um, Maureen, I mentioned, um, did a lot of the mass spec, and this has been a big collaboration with Sewan and also uh, with uh, the Archer Lab and the Miller Lab. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Garza. That was a great state-of-the-art lecture. I think it's going to fit in well with many of the other uh, abstracts at this meeting looking at um, the rapidly advancing field of understanding fibroblast phenotypes, uh, you know, much of this driven by RNA-seq and just how different different types of fibroblasts are. So I commend you on, on uh, going rapidly to clinical applications of this type of uh, technology. Um, unfortunately, we're running a little bit late, so I'm going to... Uh, not uh, read the questions, but um, hope that you can uh, answer them uh, offline. And as I mentioned earlier, um, Dr. Garza's talk has been recorded. All of these questions will be recorded um, and um, people will have an opportunity to uh, correspond with you uh, through, through uh, uh, offline after that. I wanna put a plug in for tomorrow, uh, May 15th where we'll be doing this again. Our plenary lecture two is scheduled to start at 12.30 Pacific time, 3.30 Eastern time. Some of those attending may wonder why the unusual times that we've picked to start these lectures, but uh, our concept of doing this virtually realized that we really have an opportunity to reach around the world. And we were trying to do a compromise where we would allow uh, many of uh, our colleagues in the SID, ESDR, and some early risers in uh, our Asian societies to also be able to join early. So um, sorry it doesn't work out for everyone, but we, we uh, hope um, that we uh, have attendance from around the world. Um, so with that, I wanna thank you, Dr. Grazer, uh, thank um, all of the plenary speakers, and um, say goodbye until tomorrow.